Hello and welcome to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we'll be concentrating on Act 2, Scene 1 of Othello, specifically the meanings, messages and methods that Shakespeare uses. So the characters arrived safely in Cyprus and yet their main reason for being there was to get rid of the Turkish fleet and it would seem that the storm killed the fleet for them. Iago is openly misogynistic in front of Desdemona and his wife Amelia. We want to uncover if they really find his attitudes to women entertaining. We definitely see a discrepancy between how Desdemona and Amelia react to him. Othello and Desdemona seem elated when they're reunited. Rodrigo is once more persuaded by Iago to provoke Cassio on the pretense that Cassio is a threat to Rodrigo's love with Desdemona. Once more we see Iago manipulating Rodrigo, but it's the first time we've really heard Cassio as the threat to Rodrigo. Iago once more shares his open hatred for Othello and explains he believes Cassio has already cuckolded him. So how could we stage this? How could you bring to life the significance that the storm has played and how it symbolises the downfall of Othello? How would Iago's coarse conversation be staged? Is Desdemona's reaction that of feigning innocence? Rimmer, if 1697, the critic believed she was acting as any country kitchen maid with her sweetheart. Suggesting really that she's too knowing and quite distasteful actually in the way she interacts with Iago if she's truly innocent. And yet Alexandra Melville says the focus of this scene is sexual appetite. And to some extent, the Jacobean ideal of total chastity leaves Desdemona vulnerable to an unforgiving male gaze. And I think that is to some extent proved true. Melville also asserts racial and female stereotypes dominate across this scene. And that's in no small part down to Iago. She claims Iago's rage against female sexuality may be just one example of his spiteful attacks on otherness to soothe his sense of social impotence. And it's interesting to note that in this scene, he has complete power, it would seem, in the monopoly of his misogyny. How does the drama unfold in this scene? Well, Cassio is delighted to see Desdemona giving Iago a hollow validity, it seems, to his claim that they have some sort of romantic entanglement, at least when he's trying to fool Rodrigo anyway. And it's here that Cassio shows his good manners, as we'd expect from his breeding. Iago's misogynistic rant mirrors a very strong pervading attitude of men in Jacobean times. Now to what extent it was just banter, we don't know in those times, but with Iago it seems to have a heart of something quite sinister. Of course, he is our antagonist after all. Here we've got this tension where women are simultaneously expected to be innocent, pure and virginal, much like the embodiment of the Virgin Mary, whom all privileged as respectable, and whom religious women were required to aspire to be like, and yet simultaneously suspecting them of being sinful, promiscuous and immodest, the incarnation of Eve, who obviously brought down the fall of man through the original sin of eating the forbidden fruit, and being banished as a consequence from Eden. So that's called the dichotomy really, the virgin whore dichotomy, because they can't simultaneously be both these things, but in Jacobean times it's as if there is a tension where simultaneously they're meant to be innocent, but they're also known not to be. And Iago once more manipulates Rodrigo into believing that Desdemona is in love with Cassio, using the half-truths that Rodrigo should follow the bait for in order to fight Cassio later in Act 2, Scene 3, and cause him, Cassio that is, to lose his position. Rodrigo does not believe Iago at first, but he changes his mind, showing how persuasive Iago can be, and it's important also for us to realise that Iago accuses Othello of having slept with his wife again. And we have to question, is this just an excuse so that his desire to destroy Othello is seen as more accepted and legitimate? Or does Iago really care about being accepted at all? The idea of romantic jealousy and revenge persists throughout this play, most notably, of course, in Act 3, Scene 3. But it's difficult, really, to see if Iago really cares. Perhaps the most intensely passionate moment of this scene is between Othello and Desdemona. And we see Othello is elated here to see her again. And their innocence heightens the dramatic irony of Iago plotting so much of the deception and manipulation that's about to follow. 
Othello states, if it were to die, twere now to be most happy. And it seems most ironic because it does seem to me the most happy that he is in this play. From here on in, it gradually gets more and more negative. So what does Shakespeare accentuate in this scene? Iago's misogyny, absolutely. His vulgar language seems to mirror that of a bawdy soldier who's forgotten that he's in female company, so much so that Cassio, discussed with Desdemona on the slide, referring to Iago as, well, we'd relish him more in the soldier than in the scholar. That's Cassio's shorthand in breeding of saying, this is not appropriate language for you to hear, and he's clearly not that clever. He seems to be more of a lad than he is a clever man. But Iago's crude bluntness definitely puts Desdemona on the back foot. She can't seem to express truly what she feels and she feels caught out actually as if it's not her place to correct a man in this scenario and actually perhaps it's also off-putting for her that she doesn't really understand how to combat this kind of bawdy army focused chat that feels like it should be just amongst the lads. Iago portrays desire with really reductive language. Desdemona's supposed love for Othello is simply violence and Othello's stories to her are just bragging, fantastical lies. There's no sense that he's understood the emotional commitment they've just invested in, in marriage. Iago likens Desdemona to some sort of sexual animal that needs a handsome man to give satiety um, to a fresh appetite. You know, she's explicitly described as rejecting further love from Othello. And the idea that she needs a handsome man is actually implied to be a white man, not like Othello. And the idea that she's going to reject uh, further love from Othello, her delicate tenderness will find itself abused, begin to heave the gorge, disrelish and abhor the more. This is actually implying lots of sexual um, misdemeanours are going to happen, whether that's gagging and retching, along with the imagery of abused tenderness. There's a kind of hint at... Um, oral sex there, linking to the Moors being stereotyped as overly sexual, which is once more ironic because the man who's fixated so much on the sexual appetite of the Moor is Iago, who is having thoughts about sexual relationships between a couple that he apparently despises. We almost feel like he needs to change the record a bit. It's also important that Iago says the wine she drinks is made of grapes. Iago is implying that Desdemona is like all women. They consume what they can get and they'll indulge in whatever greedy pleasures they have. And that image is switched actually later in Act 3, Scene 4, um, when Amelia states that men are all but stomachs and we all, you know, but need food. And so that to me suggests that that relationship between Amelia and Iago is fueled on some pretty rocky foundations also. And there's some obvious awareness points for us of how that has cast a doubt on their marriage. They don't understand each other. As we learn later when in Act 5, Scene 2, she is shocked to learn that Iago is the reason why this whole unravelling of the tragedy is happening. So let's dig deeper into Machiavellian manipulation in the form of Iago. Throughout the speech he gives to Rodrigo, his forcefulness covers his illogical reasoning and it overpowers Rodrigo, who we know is a fool, but he dismisses Desdemona sort of just paddling Cassio's hand as a simple courtesy, but admits that he did see it, suggesting that there's already flirtation going on between the two of them. However, Iago tells the audience earlier that it is Cassio, not Desdemona, who takes by the palm. Through this language, Rodrigo is tricked into being misled and misinterpreting events. And we know that this is just foreshadowing what will later happen when Othello, Othello sorry, falls for the same trick from Act 3, Scene 3, all the way through to Act 5, Scene 2. It's tragic stuff, but its foundations are laid in Act 2. So what are the takeaways from this specific scene? Misogyny is so accepted in this time period, it would seem, that even Iago, who hides every negative aspect of himself, seems quite open uh, and sees no reason at all to hide or cover his own feelings towards women. Now, it's important to be careful here. This doesn't mean it was really accepted. It could have been a bit of banter that was often shared amongst men, not necessarily shared so openly with women. And Iago plans to drive Othello insane, using the suggestion that Cassio is sleeping with his wife not only to get his revenge in his own mind for what he believes Othello has done, 
uh, with his wife, but he thinks that Othello will reward him by giving him a higher position. Roderigo now wants to get revenge on Cassio because he believes that Desdemona has fallen in love with him. The audience knows that a fight will happen and we know there will be disastrous consequences just by the very nature of how well Iago's plan is going together so far. And in the long term, we as an audience realise that Othello's jealousy is going to lead to his downfall. Iago's plan to destroy Othello is quickly coming to fruition. And even if it's the fool, Roderigo at this time, that believes him, there is definitely a sense that a romantic relationship between Cassio and Desdemona could be seen as believable. The other thing I would like to acknowledge is that when Othello does join this scene, he is more interested in the reunion with his love than he is with the business that's already happened with the Turkish fleet. His priorities are much more about love, what is really a private thing, than the public sphere, which is his job description, really, in Cyprus. We already know this is a key to his downfall. He should be thinking about business, not pleasure. Why not subscribe to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar for all things English, literary and grammatical?